reconvene the December 8th, 2020 meeting of the Marine Resources Commission. Next item on the agenda is item 10, public hearing. Proposal to amend chapter four BAC 2510-10 pertaining to Amberjack and Cobia. Who will be handling this? I will be, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Please proceed. <clears throat> okay, so this is a public hearing for Cobia. <sighs> Take my mask off. <laughs> Proposal to amend chapter four BAC 20-510 pertaining to Amberjack and Cobia to establish a new recreational season and vessel limit to comply with the required reductions per amendment one of the interstate fisheries management plan for Atlantic migratory group Cobia, as well as establishing a prohibition on gapping. So to start with some history of Cobia management, uh, in 2017, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, ASMFC, adopted the Interstate Fishery Management Plan, or FMP, for the Atlantic Migratory Group Copia. It was a cooperative management with the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Councils and defined the management unit from Georgia through New York. The FMP set the coastwide recreational harvest limit, or RHL, at 620,000, wait, yeah, 620,000 pounds, and the coastwide commercial harvest limit at 50,000 pounds. So Virginia receives 39.4% of the coastwide RHL, which during that time equated to approximately 244,000 pounds or 8,700 fish. The table on the slide shows the recreational management measures in Virginia in 2017 through 2019. At the March 27, 2018 commission meeting, the commission approved amendments to the recreational copia season. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 15 days were added to the season, while size and vessel limits remain the same because the predicted landings using the average weight from carcass donation program were much lower than the RHL, which you can see in red in this table right here. This reasoning was also used to remove the gaffing prohibition and regulation. In 2019, Amendment 1 transferred the FMP to sole management by ASMFC. At the February ASMFC meeting, a new harvest quota of 80,112 fish, or 2.4 million pounds, was set in response to the new COBIA stock assessment. It's important to note that the quota is now given in fish, not pounds, so Virginia can no longer use the carcass program weights to receive additional fish to the state RHL. In October 2020, Addendum 1 to the FMP was approved by ASMFC, which changed the sector allocations. The new sector allocations are 96% recreational and 4% commercial. Amendment 1 established a harvest specification process which allows states to set their own season and vessel limits to achieve their respective targets. However, these state management measures must be, must be evaluated every three years. With this language in the FMP, we can only adjust the vessel limit and the season to achieve the new soft target. Size limit adjustments are not allowed. When we asked for clarification from ASMFC on this, it was actually noted that when final action was taken in 2019, the board was intentional and in not wanting differing size limits among the states. As such, all states must adhere to the 36 inch fork length or 40, 40 inch total length <clears throat> minimum size limit. So ASMFC actually mandates that all states participating in the COBIA FMP must use MRIP data to complete the three-year fishery evaluation. The average of the past three years of MRIP, 2017 through 2019, indicates Virginia must take a reduction of at least 40% to achieve that new soft target. In this table, you will see the COBIA and MRIP totals from each year, the average of the three years, the new target, and what we must reduce in order to achieve that new target. Again, like I said, 
MRIP data is the only data approved by ASMFC for determining the reductions to this fishery. <clears throat> so staff calculated reductions for this fishery prior to the approval of Addendum 1 in preparation for the COBIA TC meeting. As such, staff used the previous sector allocations of 92% recreational and 8% commercial. The reduction required using the previous sector allocations was actually 42%, which is a greater reduction than the, action, the now required 40%. Staff explored reduction options at both 40% and 42%, and the differences between the options were so small that staff recommends proposed management options based on the original 42% reduction. The recreational cobia fishery in Virginia has quickly expanded and staff would like to exercise an abundance of caution to further ensure a sustainable recreational fishery. So our recommended management measures are as following. Staff recommends the 2021 through 2023 recreational cobia regulations to be the following. The season of June 15th through September 15th, which is a reduction of 30 days. The possession limit is one per person or two per vessel, whichever is more restrictive, which is a reduction of uh, one fish. The minimum size, like I mentioned already, will stay the same, 40 inch total length, or can have one on vessel greater than 50 inches. And we want to propose prohibiting gaffing. So although gaffing is not recognized as a quantitative way by ASMFC to achieve a reduction, staff is still recommending a prohibition. In the years that gaffing was prohibited, only 2% of intercepted cobia were undersized. In the years that gaffing was not prohibited, 15% of the intercepted cobia by MRIP were undersized. Anecdotally, several, several anglers have indicated that as the cobia fishery grows, more and more inexperienced anglers who participate are gaffing undersized fish. Although there is not enough data to show a direct relationship between gaffing and harvest of undersized fish, the correlation observed by staff and the anecdotal information provided by anglers indicates that stricter management measures may benefit Virginia's recreational cobia fishery over the long term. We will now walk through the regulation. As you may recall, staff has an ongoing task of cleaning up regulations when we open them to address regulatory issues. Suggestions on language and editorial updates are shown in brown, and then the regulatory changes will be in yellow. So first, in section 12 definitions, we're updating the recreational vessel uh, definition. So it will now read, recreational vessel means any vessel, kayak, charter vessel, or headboat fishing recreationally. So this new definition for recreational vessel, vessel will replace the redundant to boat or vessel and the recreational specific proportion, portions of the regulation, which are section 20, subsection A and C, and then section 30, subsection D. And then in the commercial specific portions of the regulation, staff is, is suggesting to redact the word boat from boat or vessel, and that would be in section 25, subsections A and D. Okay, so section 15, so this is the recreational cobia permit and mandatory reporting. So staff received several phone calls this year from anglers confused about what it meant to not participate in the cobia season. And we're hoping that the addition of this language will assist anglers in understanding what it means to not participate. So the change comes at that last sentence. Any captain or operator who did not take fishing trips to target cobia during the current recreational cobia season is still required to report a lack of participation or lack of participation. Uh, subsection B, this is the same idea, but this is uh, for people who are not fishing from a vessel. So again, it's the last sentence. Any permittee who did not take fishing trips to target cobia during the current recreational cobia season is still required to report lack of participation. So subsection C, um, we are suggesting using a hard date of 21 days after the close of the season instead of um, just saying the 21st day after the close of the season, so October 6th, which I'll read out in a second. 
Um, this will hopefully make it easier for anglers reading the regulation to know the required deadline. Um, as you'll see in number three, staff is also recommending removing the seven day requirement for trips where cobia were caught. This portion of the regulation is not enforceable and staff has anecdotal evidence that anglers hesitate to report catches if they miss this deadline and instead are opting to report did not fish. So number one, any permittee who did not take any fishing trips to target cobia during the recreational cobia season shall report the permittee's lack of participation by midnight on October 6th of that calendar year. Number two, any permittee shall report trips where cobia were targeted but not successfully caught by midnight on October 6th of that calendar year. And then number three, any permittee shall report trips where cobia were caught, whether harvested, released, or possessed by midnight on October 6th of that calendar year. Again, uh, subsection D, staff is suggesting that we use a hard date of 21 days after, uh, instead of 21 days after the close of the season. So following October 6th of that current calendar year, any permittee who failed to report for any season shall be ineligible to, ineligible to receive a recreational COBIA permit for the following calendar year, but shall be eligible to reapply for that permit in subsequent years. So subsection 20 has a new title, or section 20, I mean, recreational fishery possession limits, season, vessel allowance, and prohibition on gaffing. So this is the new definition in subsection A of recreational vessel, and then the new staff recommended vessel limit of two cobia per recreational vessel per day. Subsection B, this is the new staff recommended season for 2021 through 2023. It shall be unlawful for any person fishing recreationally to harvest or possess any cobia before June 15th or after September 15th of the current calendar year. And then finally, a new uh, subsection D. It shall be unlawful for any person fishing recreationally to gaff or attempt to gaff any cobia. So staff met with FMAC on October 14th, 2020 via WebEx. Uh, there was a quorum and 14 members of the public were in attendance. With public input, FMAC reduced the eight staff options to five uh, to present as a survey, which we will go over in a second. After discussion, FMAC did vote unanimously to approve staff recommendation, which is listed there again for you. So staff had a survey open to the public from October 19th through October 30th, and there were 591 respondents. The reduction option receiving the most votes at 49% was the staff recommended season and vessel limit. The next most popular reduction option at 26% was to reduce the vessel limit to one fish while maintaining the 2018 and 2019 season. The issue of gaffing was split almost evenly with 48% of respondents supporting the prohibition of gaffing and 52% of respondents opposing the prohibition. Staff also received four public comments via email to our fisheries at mrc.virginia.gov email address. We had one comment that supports status quo, two comments that suggest removing the greater than 50 inch fish allowance and creating a slot to protect large females. And then we also got um, a letter from VSSA that supports staff recommendation, but without the prohibition on gaffing. VSSA did actually conduct their own survey as well, and the gaffing results were mostly split even, evenly like the VMRC survey, although the prohibition on gaffing and the VSSA survey received six more votes. All public comments are in attachment one of your packets. So again, here's the staff recommendation. Staff recommends the commission approve amendments to chapter four VAC 20-510 pertaining to Amberjack and Cobia to establish a, recreation, a new recreational season and vessel limit to comply with the required reductions per amendment one of the interstate fisheries management plan for my, Atlantic migratory group Cobia, as well as establishing a prohibition on gaffing. The management measure changes are in yellow at the bottom of the slide. So the season again, June 15th through September 15th, 
session limit of one per person or two per vessel and to prohibit gaffing. And I will now be happy to take any questions. Any questions by members of the commission for Ms. Smart? This is Dr. Neal, I have a question. Please, yeah. Dr. Neal. Uh, on the, the survey monkey thing that y'all did, that there, if I remember correctly, there was an option you identified yourself as a recreational angler or as a charter boat captain. Do you have that breakdown? To the, how do the charter boat captains feel? Um, so we didn't, I didn't uh, actually screenshot that portion, but I will show you. This is the um, VMRC versus VSSA, but I will say um, the charter captain percentage would, was much lower than the private angler. I think the private angler actually ended up being over 75% of the respondents. Um, but I can get you that actual number later, but it was a much higher for private English. Yeah, I guess my question was, I, I was more interested in, in knowing what season did the charter captains prefer? So we didn't look at like individual, we didn't like track individual answers. Uh, we more like looked at the overall responses. Um, we did have some free, we had a free section at the bottom where people could write what they wanted. Um, and I don't recall anybody asking, like specifically saying I'm a charter captain and I would like X, Y, and Z. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know if I can answer that fully for you. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Dr. Neal, excuse me, Dr. Neal, this is Pat here. Uh, just to let you know, 11% of the respondents were charter captains on our survey. And um, we can look at the survey. We can go back into the survey and look at that to see how they responded on that. But we just don't have that available right now. Thank you, Mr. Gear. Further questions by members of the commission? All right. This is a public hearing. Um, I've been informed by my capable staff that there are three people that wish to speak. Um, they are not signed up. So what I'll do is open up and open up the uh, phones and see who would like to speak first. So the first one we have is Mike Wills. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wills, are you on? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear good me? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. Can you proceed, please? Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And uh, I'd like to just start by saying, um, generally, I support uh, proactive um, you know, regulations when it comes to our fisheries. I just go back to when I started saltwater fishing in the early 90s and, uh, you know, primarily flounder fishing. And, you know, we had an eight fish per person limit back then. And I just always scratched my head, you know, wondering who the heck would, would need eight uh uh, flounder per person and we would generally uh, stop fishing for them when we had two or three and now you know you guys I'm sure are aware of the the condition of the flounder fishery these days and so when we um, changed the cobia regulations a few years ago you know and I supported the uh, season and the reduction from uh, six fish per boat you know one per person up to six you know down to three uh, because it was just obvious there was a lot more fishing pressure on this species and we need to take some action if we were going to, uh, you know, preserve this uh, great fishery that we have. Um, you know, and also supported the, um, the, uh, the mandatory re requirement to report your fishing effort. Um, I think that's a great idea and give us some real good data to use um, as the years go on. And now we have quite a few years of that and um, going back to 2017. And so I'm just uh, scratching my head at this, this new regulation because the, the data is just so far off, you know, from the MRIP estimates, um, especially when you look at a year like 2018, where they're saying we underreported our catch by 20 fold. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and they're saying our, our keep went up, you know, basically five fold from 2017 to 2018, and then dropped back a third in 2019 and it just uh like i said statistically appears you know almost impossible to uh catch and keep as many fish as they claim in 2018 you know assuming every day of the 120 day season was fishable you're talking about 220 boats keeping their limit every single day and um, anybody who fishes the chesapeake bay knows all those days aren't fishable probably a third of them aren't due to due to weather and conditions 
And our VMRC stats from the mandatory reporting shows about a 76% release rate, which is very consistent with my own experience fishing for this fish over the last 10 years. So that would suggest that, you know, we had over 300 boats out there, two thirds of the days catching at least 12 fish and, and keeping there three. Again, it just uh, seems statistically impossible to have that kind of pressure on these fish and that kind of success. I know a lot of you board members have probably fished for cobia and know it's a, an exciting and very good fishery, but, but it just isn't that good. Um, you know, I've, I've put a lot of effort into it, like I said, the last 10 years and, and uh, you know, rarely do we have consistent, you know, days where we catch 12 fish or anywhere close to that, much less seeing 12 fish out there. Um, so, it, and just, you know, as far as the MREP data goes, again, just, it just seems, un, seems unfathomable. I fish out of Lynn Haven. Uh, boat ramp primarily one to two days a week on very nice days. I pick my days and in the last 10 years, I think I've been uh, approached one time to survey my catch. So just uh, really mind boggling how the um, MREPs come up with these uh, numbers and estimates that they're using to, to force this reduction on us. So again, I'm, I'm all for being proactive. It just seems uh, the, the recreational anglers are really you know, feeling the brunt of this uh, as well as other fisheries, and it just doesn't make sense based on the data. And I have not seen any kind of good explanation, you know, why our data is so different. Uh, there's no way our mandatory, we're underreporting fish to the extent that they you know, seem to think we are. Um, you know, our, 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 our catch data has been pretty consistent, you know, as more and more people have been fishing for this fish in terms of the release numbers and the, and the fish kept. and. So I, I would hope that uh, VMRC would uh, you know, really uh, push back a little bit on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and uh, you know, look out for the Commonwealth of Virginia and the recreational fishermen, because we do have a, a tremendously positive impact to our, our state economy. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of industries out there depend on it. And this is one of the, the few fisheries that, you know, that we can actually uh, get out there and and has some success in during the, during the summer months now. As I mentioned, you know, flounder seem to be pretty much uh, non-existent nowadays, as I'm sure you're aware. So, and uh, as for the gaffing prohibition, um, I, I just, you know, I, it's often said that, you know, cobia fight harder once they're in the boat. And, uh, you know, you get some of these large fish in the boat and, and they can really wreak some havoc. I've had two cobia blowout nets. I've had cobia blow out two nets in the, last few years, one break a rod and one shatter the front of a tackle box. And, and being able to gaff a large fish and place them directly in a fish box is a, a very useful option at times. And I think this is just another example of overburdensome government regulation that, that puts anglers in harm's way and does very little, if anything, to help the fishery. So I would just hope that you take uh, my comments into consideration and, uh, you know, apply a little common sense uh, and just, you know, push back on Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We've already taken a, a big hit going to three fish uh, limits on the boat and raised our size to 40 and only one over 50 and, and such. And, you know, um, there is more pressure on these fish and, and with the, the lop, you know, you know, four weeks off of our season, um, you know, it's just going to be a dramatic impact. We catch a lot of fish in, in June and you know, it's something that we look forward to. And um, I hope that, like I said, uh, we'll do what we can to preserve uh, Virginia's right to participate in this fishery. And as far as support goes for the options, I know we had a lot of the survey, uh, people respond to the survey, uh, but basically, you know, it was the, 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 the support was for the least of five bad options. I, still, I don't think any of the respondents uh, are really in favor of this uh, drastic of a reduction. So again, I thank you for your time and, um, like I said, hope that the uh, Virginia Marine Resources Commission Board will look out for the recreational fishermen and uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wills. Any questions for Mr. Wills by members of the commission? All right, thank you. Who do we have next, Jenna? Uh, Bill, Bill Gorham is next. Mr. Gorham? Thank you, I'm Bill Gorham, owner of Boat Up Lures. Um, out of Southern Shores, North Carolina. Um, I was a pointer participant of every part of the most recent COBIA stock assessment. I was assisted in grant proposals in both North Carolina and more recently with VIMS. I'd like to say VIMS is awesome. Everything 
that uh, I've done with them. They are fantastic to work with, um, as well as the VRMC staff. They've been very, very helpful and uh, no, no problems there. Um, I've also participated in some data efforts and as some of you know, I've been a part of this ongoing battle. I think we're going on five years. Um, recently, I was put as a legislative plaxi on the Atlantic states as well. Um, I have a, a slew of issues with what's going on. Um, ultimately, it's unfortunate that we are just continuing the crisis management and away from under federal management. Um, that is clearly too small for Virginia. Um, as far as the proposed regulations uh, with the June 15th start date, um, my concern with that is, is that it disenfranchises peer anglers up in the Bay, mostly Buck Row, but any other peer that seems to get that peak free in mid-May and early June. Um, unfortunately, this is a, a continuing trend with other fisheries, um, such as bluefish, spot, and croaker. Um, I think that the root cause or frustration with people is we've gone through the second stock assessment. Um, this one's showing a much larger biomass, still extremely data poor, um, with vital data not being um, inputted because it wasn't there for North Carolina and Virginia, um, but we're working on that. Um, the current harvest limits um, or allocations um, provide absolutely no wiggle room to offset the variabilities in MRIP, um, which is concerning for the future of the fishery. Um, it, it's, we almost know these regulations, we could catch three to four times what the allocation for Virginia is. Um, so we have, there's clearly a lot of work to do. Um, I agree fully with what the previous public comment said, and I truly wish that there was as much will now as there was several years ago. Um, and that's with me also supporting um, more restrictive regulations than what we currently have. There's clearly an increase in effort. Um, I think it's still over 80% of the cobia tagged in the bay are recaptured in the bay. So we, Virginia kind of has its unique own fishery and I've always felt should have that flexibility to manage its fishery, um, obviously under a, a harvest constraint uh, to the level that it's a 40% reduction. We are literally coming off the second stock assessment of not overfished. Overfishing is not occurring, and we're even further away um, than before. But Virginia, Virginia alone is being forced to a 40% reduction, um, primarily off emirate estimates that nobody believes. Um, so what I would honestly like to see um, if possible, is some numbers run um, that could incorporate a June 1st start date. Um, I had always envisioned a possibility of some small mid-season closure to extend the season as long as possible. I know there was some comment on um, it could be an enforcement issue, but I don't really see the difference between a couple week enforcement issue in the middle of the summer than the six weeks of when the cobia will be in the bay waters in May and early June during the closure as well. Um, but I can see that it is possible. As far as the gaff issue goes, I've always stayed away from it um, because I think we have such bigger problems um, than the use of a gaff. But the comment I will say is I absolutely believe that pure anglers should be able to use a road gaff um, to land cobia. It is very hard to land a larger cobia in a pier net. Um, I've seen some very nice fish from some very young anglers get lost. Um, they're not like any other fish. They're hard 
fighting fish and uh that's all i have i would love to answer any questions you may have thank you mr gorm any questions about members of the commission Mr. Gorm, I've got just, just a, a couple, if I could. Um, you indicated that by your own accord, your own observations, that the effort has exploded um, as far as COBE is concerned. We've seen a significant increase. And I know that because I had a five-year hiatus where I was not commissioner before I came back. And then when we started talking about COBE, I'm like, when did this really become an issue? So obviously, between the years of 2012 and 2017, which correlates with the uh, the numbers that we're seeing, there's been an explosion as far as the effort is concerned. And and you also indicate that you, while you acknowledge that to be the case, you don't believe the MRIP numbers, but the MRIP numbers tend to indicate that there's a correlation between the explosion of effort and the number of fish being caught. Can you help me with that one? Um, I would actually say, because we really dug into um, the MRIP data, I actually had a long meeting with our state um, data department. Uh, and, and our disbelief, my disbelief in the number is frankly the effort that would be required to harvest as many cobia that was being estimated. I mean, we're talking about thousands of boats only catch in over 80% of those only catching one fish. Um, and of the thousands of boats, only 20 to 25% of those are catching any fish. Um, I do think there has been increased effort and that's in part to people will fish for what's abundant or popular. Um, as well as when you have these season start dates or seasons in general, it becomes such a shotgun approach of, you know, everybody's gearing up for it, everybody's gearing up for it. But we also did regulations increasing the size limit um, to allow additional year of spawning to get those, to kind of offset that effort um, and get more equipment in before the fish enter the fishery. And I think it's absolutely worked. And that's why, uh, we have seen more catch because there's fish and yes, there's more people fishing, but not at all to the level. It's, it's just simply not possible. Okay. All right, and to the, to the point of gaffing, going back to what Mr. Wills had to say, um, he said sometimes, you know, the thing that's there um, about the, the gaffing or whatever, and it's so much safer to go ahead and gaff and get him in the fish box before anything else happens. Um, and, and your your assertion that that, uh, that maybe we should be able to use pier gaffs um, because many young people have lost a cubby or whatever. The problem with that is that you have minimum size. If you're gaffing them and throwing them in the fish box, you potentially risk the harm of killing the fish, which you don't want to do if it's undersized and matching him with the gaff and putting him in the fish box doesn't give you a whole lot of time to measure it before potential harm is done to the fish, whether you're in a boat or whether you're on the pier when you drop the gaff overboard and gaff it. So I guess my question would be, if you have a minimum size that you're trying to maintain as part of a regulation, how does that gaffing activity come into play? Uh, I guess I should be clear, uh, my comment on the use of a rope gaff was just for peer anglers. Um, I understand that that could somewhat be an enforcement issue, but also we have, we can still spear fish cobia. Um, so I wasn't advocating using a rope gaff on a boat. Um, I, I actually have no position on the gaff as far as it pertains to on the boat. Um, I think it's a very divisive as far as people that support it, people that don't. Uh, I just uh, have strong opinion on the, the ability to use it on a pier. I do understand what you're saying as far as having a minimum size limit. Um, and again, we're looking at a 2% number. Um, and, I, and I just think if I had to make a choice of make a position on it, 
Um, I agree with what you're saying, but I also think if, if we're going to take a 40% cut, um, maybe we should have something a little bit stronger wise on uh, restricting the use of a gaff. But I, I actually feel that you should be required to have a landing net if you already could. Um, just because you should have a net because there's a lot of smaller fish, smaller fish in general, and the per person and vessel limits are smaller. So you should absolutely have a net um, to be able to safely release the fish. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gorm. Really appreciate yes, your participation and appreciate what you did at ASMFC. I've seen you up there and when we used to get see each other and talk and participate. But anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Ms. Matson, who do we have next? Jonathan French is next. Mr. French, you're on board. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I had some prepared comments, but I'd like to respond to a couple of the uh, discussion items that have already come up as well. Uh, first of all, to the rhetorical questions about the uh, MRIP estimate that the first public commenter offered, I, I think, and to your question, Billy, about the increase in effort, um, yes, effort has increased. I, um, I don't know if that's a trend that's evident in the number of applicants for COBIA uh, permits, which I would have liked to have heard in the staff presentation, but I, you know, have believed that that trend is going upwards. Does that upward trend match up with the exponentially larger MRIP uh, effort estimate variable? Absolutely not. Uh, and MRIP changed, I believe, uh, uh, last year, but it may be two years ago now, that significantly increased uh, the number of, and I appreciate the information on the screen, it doesn't tell me the number of people who uh, have permits, just tells me the number of people who have reported, but it is increasing. Uh, the number of, uh, or the exponential increase in effort is one of the reasons for the restriction on the fishery, despite the fact that the latest stock assessment determined that the, the biomass was three times larger than the biomass estimate back in 2014 that, that required some of these changes. And I think everybody needs to realize there are more restrictions coming because there's discussion at uh, within the ASMFC framework for increasing the uh, release mortality variable, again, with very questionable, very dubious data uh, to increase. So we're going to look at another restriction in the future. I wanted both of those things on the record. Um, with regards to your question to Billy about the netting of a cobia, uh, I think, and based on my experience, I'm primarily a pure angler, although I've been able to boat a little more the last five years. Uh, based on my experience, if you've got a 40, anywhere from a obviously 35 to 45 inch fish, you're going to attempt to use a drop net the same way you would do for a red drum. The drop nets are designed for a red drum. Cobia are much more difficult to land. They do fight at the net, but you can land one. When you have a 55 to 60 inch fish, which I've been blessed uh, to catch two uh, in that size class off the pier, uh, want getting that fish into the net, much less being able to get it up without destroying the net, uh, without doing most likely irreparable harm to that fish, uh, it's next to impossible. You're going to lose the fish. The fish is likely going to be harmed badly anyway. Uh, there's no option of releasing it if you do get it up. Uh, you know, not having the gaff available in terms of the pier angler, uh, I think is silly. I have no qualms on the boat. Um, so those are just some comments uh, that I have. Um, I wanted to go into my uh, regular recommendations. I want it for the record that the vast majority of commenters at the FMAC meeting uh, supported a mid-season closure, a closure during Ju the period in July, whether it was 15 days or for the whole month of July. And we run a, a Facebook group uh, that has over a thousand members and we polled our members similarly to the way VSSA polled their members. Uh, prior to the FMAC meeting and the folks who were not completely outraged at the idea of any restriction uh, also supported in a vast majority a July closure. We were informed at the FMAC meeting that a July, a mid-season closure was not an option um, and that's why that was not part of the survey. 
uh, vehemently uh, protested, but um, unfortunately, uh, my concerns were not met. Um, I'm recommending an option where if we're going to have this restriction, uh, one, uh, we consider a July closure and add 15 days in June and 15 days in September, or 30 days with the season opening on May 15th and closing on August 31st with a July closure. Um, that was the, the will of the vast majority of the uh, constituency of our face group, Facebook group, uh, that if there had to be a restriction, that was their primary option. Um, a second option, and this goes to Billy's uh, point regarding the uh, peer anglers, uh, as Billy said, the peak uh, season for cobia, especially on Buckrow Pier in the Hampton waterfront, is May 15th through June 7th, approximately. Uh, and most of that catch happens at, at Buckrow Pier. Um, these moves are essentially disenfranchising any land-based angler, especially those who don't have access to the very limited space available uh, at Little Island Pier and Sandbridge and Virginia Beach Pier. Uh, so essentially you are taking someone who can't afford a boat out of the fishery with the seasons as recommended uh, in staff's proposal. Um, the purpose of fishing, fishing management is to ensure the fair and equitable access of a maximum sustainable yield of the fishery for everybody, not just the people who have boats, not just the people who have the time uh, to use those boats on a frequent basis, but everybody who has an interest in the fishery should have a reasonable opportunity to participate. The current proposals that staff has made are denying fair and equ equitable access for fishermen who are without boats, and unfortunately, their voices are rarely heard in this forum. Um, and as I noted before, a vast majority of the stakeholders that I talked with supported a mid-season closure, and that has not been uh, considered. And I think that you would find, uh, of all the recreational anglers who are angry, uh, a July closure, uh, especially given that you know the, the catch estimates for July are very high, but the actual reality of the fishery is that that's a little bit of a down period. Um, uh, I think you would find that the anglers would be much more supportive of a July closure uh, than a restriction of the season at the beginning and the end. And as I noted before, uh, you know, I would like there to be either a peer only uh, season available early in the year. I don't know that that's possible under the law. And a, uh, the GAF rule, I would like there to be an exemption for peer anglers uh, and specifically trust their good nature, uh, trust that they will make the right decision about choosing a net or GAF and then enforce properly if they're not. Uh, th those are my comments, uh, and I would like to finish that off by also ask, thanking staff for all their hard work, but asking for our representation at Atlantic States to be much, much more strenuous in advocating on behalf of the rights of the Virginia anglers when some of the shell game uh, data uh, presentations and some of the manipulations of the data points that aren't available uh, are brought up. It's very frustrating that I have I have taken a personal beating from the folks that I've been trying to help the last few years for supporting the mandatory reporting program. And then when Atlantic State says that they won't accept that data uh, for making our management decisions, it's a, it's a slap in the face to all the people, including on this commission, that have advocated uh, for that mandatory reporting to take place. That data is valid. The sample size is significantly larger than MRIP, and for it to be dismissed when it clearly shows that MRIP is overestimating catch it is frankly unacceptable and violates the entire intent that Atlantic States, uh, excuse me, that Atlantic States was established with. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, sir. Greatly appreciate it. And understand where you're coming from. Any questions for the gentleman by members of the commission? All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Madsen, anyone else? I don't have anybody else lined up, Commissioner. All right, th thank you. Yeah. This matters before the commission for discussion and action. Dr. Neal, would you like to start as our, <laughs> recreational, as our recreational member? I'd like to 
look, not to put you on the spot, but I'd like to hear. You're gonna put me on the spot. <laughs> okay, well, you you got me at PRFC last week, so anyway, here you go. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I've I've communicated with Pat a bit. You know, I from a personal standpoint, what I would prefer is a longer season. The longer the season, the better. And and so, and from so a personal standpoint. A one fish boat limit allowing me to extend the season, and I would extend it into May. Uh, he told me I can't do that, but I'd do it anyway. <laughs> um, you know, and so it, that that's a personal thing. Now, as far as the gaffing thing, uh, I would prefer the option to be able to gaff a big cobia. Now, having said that, I haven't got gaffed a cobia in years. Uh, but uh, you know, my my worry is I'm gonna go out there tagging fish on uh, May May twentieth and. And, uh, and I'm going to have a 120 pound cobia, barely hooked, and I'm not going to be able to keep it because the season's closed. And uh, I have actually have real worries about that kind of stuff. And then I'm not going to be able to gaff it because we, we've done the gaff. So that's all personal stuff. Now, you know, as far as what I'm going to support, that's why I was asking about the charter boat captains. I, you know, I think they really think they need a two fish boat limit. Uh, for me, I'm fishing by myself. I mean, I kept two cobia last year total. Um, and so I, that's not a, not a, a big thing uh, for, you know, for me, the number of fish I keep, I just like fishing for them. I like the season to be open longer. Yeah, so, so basically what I personally would, would, would prefer is not what I'm going to support. I'm going to support staff recommendation. I am really surprised that, that the gaffing thing is almost 50-50. I, I really uh, um, expected that to be a much more uh, thought against like it was earlier. I have no problem with an exception for a gaff thing uh, with the uh, on pier. But I guess those are my opening comments. I'm willing to comment later. Thank you, sir. Um, other members of the commission? Ed Tankard. Mr. Tankard. I was wondering, I, you know, the IMRA data the the, the uh, we've heard in testimony a couple times that people believe it's off from what is the actual data that we've reported. I wonder if uh, staff might uh, speak to that a bit. Summers, do you want to handle that? Or do you want Mr. Gear to handle it? Or yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, okay. Shut so up. here, hold on. Let me get to my slide. So I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, so unfortunately, we uh, the data for the program have been inconsistent due to different regulations. Um, so really, with our data, the only year that is counting pretty much or could count possibly to for ASMFC is from 2019 to 2020 because we had uh, the revocation put in the regulation. Um, Previous years, there's different regulations, and also, uh, like you, it wasn't a requirement, fully a requirement to report. Um, it also requires an evaluation. Um, so ASMC would have to evaluate the program in order to use it. Uh, and, you know, it's just the reporting rate has, hasn't been as high as it could have been, you know, at 77%. Um, it's the highest it has been, but um, it's just not the best. We have done a, compar a statistical comparison between MRIP data and our data, and they are not drawn from the same population. So it's just not comparable. Um, and ASMFC is really only approving MRIP data. So that's what we have to use. That's what all states down the coast that participate in the FMP use. So. Um, that's just what we have to use for now. And then Shanna and, and is coming over here. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I was going to provide a few more comments on that. Um, we did speak with ASMFC. We know that this is a concern for our anglers. Um, they are in the process of working, two groups are working together, the Assessment Science Committee um, and the Recreational Technical Committee of the Atlantic Coastal Cooperative Statistics Program are working together to start to discuss how best to use state uh, reported data for recreational fishing. So we are hoping to work with them in the coming year to gain a better understanding of 
what data sources we are able to use when taking, when looking at our recreational fishing. Um, we just don't have any clear direction right now except that MREP data is the gold standard. It is statistically significant. So to, to say that, you know, we have a large number of people reporting is not the same as being able to say that it's statistically significant. So we do, um, we do have plans to work with ASMFC to see how best to utilize this data, and we do hope to have a better answer for you on that next year. And then I was just going to add, this is also a list of common reporting errors. So we run into these uh, uh, every year. So people are double counting people on the same boat. They're re uh, reporting information in the comments section. We have anecdotal evidence of people that report just one trip to satisfy the requirement because we stop emailing them to remind, to remind them. Um, and then people who report no activity and also report trips and then people who just report no activity right at the beginning of the season, so. Yeah, this, this is Pat Gear. Uh, somebody had asked earlier what our numbers were on permits. In 2016, it was about 6,600. This year is about 8,300 total permits. And that's with, that's with almost 2,000 revocation, uh, revoke permits for this year. So potentially those people are going to be coming back into the fishery, you know, it, because it's a one-year revocation. So, yeah, we are seeing an increase in permits, which is probably an indication of an increase, you know, a very large increase in effort as well. And one of the things is MREP is being done, has been done over a number of years. Our survey is, you know, our, our data that we've been collecting, you really can't use 2006 because it was a voluntary, voluntary system. So, and we've had some changes since 2017. And, you know, we're hoping at some point we can use this data, you know, to augment, augment the stock assessments and be able to use this along with MREP. But, you know, it, it's not, the, it's not the magic gun right now. We've only got four years of data and, and ASMFC is not going to accept the data set that's such a short term period. So we need more, we need to collect more years of data before that will be able to be used. And we have to have our anglers do what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to report their landings. They're supposed to do it correctly. And they're not supposed to just, you know, check a box and try to get it done with so they don't have to worry about it anymore. We would love to use this data, but it has to be collected. Our, we're relying on our anglers to collect this data correctly. And that's where, that's where the, you know, the rubber hits the road. If you want us to use this data, you have to make sure you do it right. Further questions by members of the commission? This is Dr. Neal. Basically, I'm, Ed, Ed's question was, what's our data compared to MRIP? And the answer is MRIP estimates are showing our catches are exponentially higher than what we're self-reported. Okay. Yes. That's, yes, that's correct. Well, you know, we can, we can beat up on MRIP, we can do a lot, but I mean, if you really want to go to data poor and really bad, go back before MRIP and see what we had when they were calling you and calling 12 years, 12 year old folks on the telephone wanting to be at a fishing license. I mean, yeah, we, we can, we can beat it up. If the bottom line is, it, as, as I've listened, if, if it doesn't match, kind of what we hoping for it to match we debate against it um the other thing that that is and i'm not gonna put you on the spot again dr neil but it sounds to me from what i heard from the comments today that there are a lot of boats that are going out there that are not catching any cobia whatsoever but they keep going and going and going and somehow that doesn't comport with me i you know if, if unless i miss something that I, that's kind of what I heard as far as the distillation of the data is concerned. And if I, if I, if I'm that bad a fisherman, I don't know that I'm going to keep going. It might be fun to ride around that boat and spend money on gas. And, but I, I just, it, it I, I guess all the statistics are a little, a little boggling or whatever, but I, going back to Mr. Gear's point, if we have the data that's accurate, that's what we can rely upon. So anyway, Matters before the commission for action. Well, I guess back to me again. Again, my 
My personal likes are one thing, but I'm going to make a motion that we approve staff recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Is there a second to the motion? Christy Everett will second. Thank you, Ms. Everett. Further discussion? Chair will call the question. Mr. France? Aye. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Uh, <clears throat> Aye. Mr. Minor? Aye. Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you all for your discussion and your comments. Next item on the agenda is item number 11, proposal to amend chapter 4 VAC 20, 127010 in sequence pertaining to Atlantic Menhaden to establish the 2021 total allowable catch per amendment three of the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Menhaden and Ecological Reference Point benchmark assessment and to establish all associated fishery sector allocations in response. Ms. Madsen. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I appreciate you taking over that mouthful for me, so I don't have to say it. <laughs> You're most welcome. You got enough. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, next slide, please, Summers. All right, so I wanted to start off the meeting by kind of giving everyone a Cliff Notes version of how we ended up where we are today with Menhaden Management. Um, I strongly use the word Cliff Notes because this is work that has been going on for over a decade. Um, and I'm going to just briefly touch on some of that today. So as a reminder to everyone, um, Atlantic Menhaden are managed uh, cooperatively through the ASMFC and they are currently under Amendment 3 to the Fishery Management Plan. You'll hear me refer to Amendment 3 several times in the presentation. Um, traditionally, Menhaden were assessed using a traditional stock assessment, which is a single species model. Um, and that focuses on Menhaden only, and that provides us information on the abundance and fishing mortality coastwide, as well as provides something co called biological reference points. And those reference points are what we traditionally use to set that total allowable catch. However, back in 2010, the Menhaden Board tasked a group called the Ecological Reference Points Work Group with developing alternative reference points for Menhaden. And these alternative reference points would be able to account for Menhaden's role as a forage species. So this would be a more ecosystem approach to managing Atlantic Menhaden. Um, for a little bit of background for everyone, um, I joined the ASMFC in 2013, and one of my assignments was as staff coordinator for the Ecological Reference Points Work Group. I continued to work with this group of scientists through my tenure with the state of New Jersey and eventually through my tenure here at VMRC. Um, so you have someone here in this room that has spent a lot of time um, working on the science behind Menhaden. Um, so what the group had been working on for several years was what we would consider interim models. So they kind of have a flavor of ecosystem modeling, but they're not true ecosystem models. And these models were really data hungry, um, and they just weren't providing the board with the feedback that they wanted. And so um, one of the things that we did was to help our model development, we held something called an ecosystem uh, management objectives workshop. Um, and this contained a broad range of representation, including um, commissioners, stakeholders, technical representatives, um, and all of these groups were here to provide various perspectives on Atlantic Menhaden management. That happened in 2015. Um, and this workshop really helped us kind of nail down what some of the ecosystem goals and objectives were that were used to select the models accordingly. So um, through many, many years of work and labor, in 2019, several models went to peer review, and these were multi-species ecosystem models, so they had predator and prey, and they kind of look like that traditional model that you see in the textbooks. It's like a giant spider web of different species all kind of collating together. Um, and we selected a model specifically for its ability to be able to look at trade-offs 
and generate something called ecological reference points or ERPs. And so you'll hear me refer to those for the rest of the presentation. Those are a change from the biological reference points based on those single species models. Next slide, please. So in 2020, the ASMSC Menhaden Board accepted these ecological reference points for management use. Um, and like I said, this decision was a result of over a decade of work with state, federal, and academic scientists and was really met with overwhelming public support. Um, this is the first application of quantitative ecological models in management on the East Coast and really represents a significant step forward for forage fish management in the United States. Um, these ERPs essentially uh, aim to provide enough menhaden to sustain striped bass, which is our most sensitive predator in these models, and it's thought that this should be sufficient for other predators within the system. Now, something that I wanted to kind of bring for the group to understand is it's really important to note that adjusting menhaden fishing pressure alone isn't the silver bullet for the ecosystem. So, if the ASMFC Menhaden Board chose to cease Menhaden fishing altogether, striped bass populations would still not recover without striped bass fishing pressure also being reduced. So it's important to understand that these ecological reference points must work in conjunction with other controls on predator fishing mortality. So in this October, the board considered setting an annual or multi-year total allowable catch. That's the TAC that you'll hear me referring to. Um, they ended up setting the TAC at approximately 194,000 uh, metric tons. And what they expressed was they wanted to strike a balance between stakeholder interests while still reducing the fishing pressure on Menhaden to reflect these new reference points. Um, as you'll recall from, I think, previous presentations that we've given, Virginia received 78.66% of the coastwide TAC, and this is after the 1% episodic events set aside program. Um, this equates to approximately 152,000 metric tons. Um, you'll see that these numbers are a little bit different from the ones that you'll see in your packet, and that's because these numbers weren't finalized until yesterday. Since per Amendment 3, the states have until December 1st to decide if they'd like to relinquish quota back to ASMFC. So that relinquished quota is then reallocated based on state percentages. So if you'll note that you'll see some of the numbers in the draft regulation are slightly different from the ones that I'm going to present today since just yesterday we actually received that memo with Virginia's final 2021 allocation. And I'll make that note um, in upcoming slides. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, I was just putting some people on mute. I was getting a bit of feedback. Okay, um, so here's where we're gonna start to get into the regulation. We'll start off with uh, section 30. Um, and section 30A, and that's on page two of your briefing booklet, um, lists that the total allowable landings for Menhaden in 2021 shall be equivalent to um, uh, approximately three, I'm not going to read all these numbers, <laughs> yeah, approximately uh, 152,000 metric tons, and again, that's 78.66% of the annual total allowable catch set forth by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So again, you'll see it's a bit of a different number than the one that you see in your commissioner briefing booklet. Um, again, just because yesterday we got our finalized numbers. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing on into section 30B, this section uh, divides our quota into our three different fisheries sectors, uh, the Persane Menhaden Reduction Sector, the Persane Menhaden uh, Bait Sector, and the Non-Persane Bait Sector. Um, the Persane Menhaden Reduction Sector uh, receives 90.04% of the total allowable Menhaden landings. The Persane Menhaden Bait Sector receives 8.38% of the allowable commercial Menhaden landings, and the non-Persane Menhaden Bait Sector is allocated a quota of 1.58% of the allowable commercial Menhaden landings. 
Next slide, please. Um, what we're going to do here is just skip ahead to section 50 because that just sort of makes sense logically. Um, that's on pages five and six of your briefing booklet. Um, this outlines the non per sane bait sector quota allocation that is then further divided into gear types. Um, all of these gear types, once again, receive a percentage of that non per sane Menhaden bait sector quota. Um, just as an FYI to the Commission, through Amendment 3, should this sector go over its uh, quota allocation, they are allowed to continue fishing on a bycatch allowance. Um, that bycatch allowance is 6,000 pounds or 12,000 if you are fishing in conjunction with someone else on your vessel. Next slide, please. We're going to go back to section 35 and um, to remind the commission per amendment three, the Chesapeake Bay cap, which is a cap, it's not a quota, um, this means that the cap cannot be transferred or rolled over, and that is set at 51,000 metric tons per year. Because there was an overage in 2019, per Amendment 3, the 2020 bay cap was reduced by the amount of that overage for 2020. There is no overage in 2020, so 2021 will revert back to the limit set by Amendment 3 of 51,000 metric tons. Next slide, please. So these are just some minor language adjustments made for clarity in section 30, um, subsection G. Um, total allowable catch is the terminology that we generally use to specify the overall coastwide quota, whereas throughout the rest of the regulation, we use the term total allowable commercial landings to specify the amount of quota the state of Virginia actually receives. Um, secondly, we did add some language to specify when Virginia will be able to consider quota transfers. Um, since our Menhaden season stretches almost to the end of the calendar year, we wanted to specify that since we won't know if there's unused Menhaden quota until the end of the calendar year um, available for transfer, we just wanted to add that language in there for clarity's sake. Um, um, in regulation, ASMFC does allow uh, quota forgiveness in the states uh, so that states can actually request quota from another state if they've experienced an overage for a previous year. Um, they probably will be taking up the time frame on what that looks like um, in coming management options, um, but this doesn't preclude us from helping another state out if we have leftover quota at the end of the year. Next slide, please. So um, this is a staff recommendation slide, um, and I kind of wanted to let folks know why uh, the staff recommendation is to uh, take the ASMFC allocated quota and adopt it into our regulation. Um, again, this is a science based on the culmination of over 10 years of work specific to the Atlantic Coast ecosystem. Uh, the ERP work group tested several different multi-species models and compared them, and they all came to similar conclusions. These went through and passed the independent peer review process. Uh, this work is also based off of the best available data and science. Um, many of these data are confidential, and so only specific groups have access to them and are able to generate scientific advice based on those data. Adjustments to the quota from ASMFC would be outside of specific scientific advice that has been generated for this stock. Um, thirdly, ecosystem management requires a lot of trade-offs. The management objectives for the fishery tried to provide a lot of balance between our different user groups. I like to kind of think of ecosystem management as a fairly complex machine. Uh, each of one of the knobs needs to be adjusted to balance the trade-offs to achieve the desired result. Um, remember, I told you earlier that even if you turn the Menhaden fishing knob all the way down to zero, striped bass would still be unable to recover alone. Striped bass fishing pressure and Menhaden fishing pressures both need to be adjusted in conjunction for striped bass spawning stock to be able to recover. There is no panacea here. Finally, I'd like to say that the stock is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. 
Um, fishing mortality before the decreased TAC was implemented was actually already lower than the ERP fishing target. So with that, the staff recommendation is to adopt these amendments to Chapter 4 VAC 20-1270-10 pertaining to Atlantic Menhaden to establish the 2021 total allowable catch per Amendment 3 to the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Menhaden and the Ecological Reference Point Benchmark Assessment and to establish all associated fishery sector allocations in response. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Ms. Matson, thank you for that very detailed report. One of the reasons that you uh, ended up in the Commonwealth of Virginia was because of your knowledge in this specific subject matter when I was deliberating uh, or making a decision. So for that, I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, ultimately made that decision. Any questions by members of the commission for Ms. Matson? Commissioner Member Christy Everett has a question. Ms. Everett, proceed, please. You know, um, great job, Ms. Matson, and obviously a lot of work has gone into this, um, and wonderful summary, too. Um, just a question about your recommendation. It's just to establish the um, 2021 total allowable catch. Just didn't know if, why that wouldn't extend to 2022 or just beyond 2021. Thanks, Ms. Everett. Yeah, the reason would be is because um, remember how I was mentioning that the states have some time to relinquish quota? Um, they have until December 1st of each year to do that. So some states did relinquish quota back to ASMFC prior to December 1st of this year. Um, that could also take place next year. So again, our quota would change based off on that since that kind of goes back into the pot and then is reallocated to the states based off of our already predetermined percentages. So um, staff recommendation is to just do 2021 since we'll have to crack this open again in 2022 once we have finalized numbers there. Thank you. Further questions by members of the commission? Oh, sorry, Chad Ballard. Um, Mr. Ballard. Question, question <laughs> on how you kind of determine um, the sector allocations. Um, and it, it, can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Sure, um, Mr. Ballard, those have been established for um, many years in code, actually. So uh, back in 2007, I believe, um, these sector allocations were established once a quota was put in place by ASMFC, previously kind of unnecessary because they didn't have a specific quota. Um, but there was a lot of deliberation, you know, before my time, uh, on these percentages um, from all of the different sectors, and they were based on historical catch rates for that time um, prior to us having a quota in, um, placed on us by the ASMFC. Uh, follow up, if I may. Yes, sir, please. Um, and so the legislature is no longer managing Manhattan. We as a commission are, to my understanding. Um, so those sector allocations would be adjustable, correct? Technically, per regulation, they would be adjustable. Um, I do want to just kind of reiterate that because these were based off of a time when there was no quota implemented on Virginia, it was easy to understand what the allocations would look like because there was no quota in place. Now that there has been a quota in place and there's been those percentages placed on those sectors, <clears throat> um, adjustments to the percentages would not be impossible but difficult just due to the fact that we were able to establish those prior to a quota being in place. See what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Um, okay, and just a one more follow up as I'm struggling to understand here, but um, could a, a decrease in quota be applied to one sector if, say, historically the sector hadn't caught their quota? The commission would have to determine that as of right now, the way that it's written in regulation, the quota is distributed per these percentages that are put in place. So a decrease in quota 
from the ASMFC is distributed amongst the sectors per the percentages that are in regulation. Again, those are based off of historical landings by those sectors prior to them needing to adhere to a sector-specific quota. Now we've had a sector-specific quota in place for several years, mm -hmm. um, and, and so we wouldn't, we don't have information on what those quotas would look like were those sectors allowed to catch as much as they would have previously before the quotas were established. Okay, Mr. Ballot, Mr. Ballot, those are great questions. We've been having those discussions with a few people and um, just recently I had a discussion with AJ Erskine who is, who's been involved with Menhaden for a number of years and he said when the General Assembly was uh, discussing these allocations, these sector allocations, it was very difficult to come to come to agreement. But yes, that 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 daunting task now falls upon, you know, me and my staff to handle that in the future. Thank and, you. And for us to ultimately approve, I think the code is specific that makes it very clear that we are responsible for the man managing of the Menhaden industry in the Commonwealth of Virginia or fishery in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Gear, for the follow up. Uh, Mr. Ballard, did you have any further, sir? No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further questions by members of the commission? This is Dr. Neal. Dr. Neal, proceed, please, sir. Uh, well, Chad actually asked most of the questions I had. Um, I, I do want to say that that I'm excited uh, in the direction that we're seeing at the council level, uh, where they're looking at protecting chub mackerel, bullet tunas, and other forage fish for more than just their value being taken out of the water. And now we're doing it with Menhaden. Uh, so that this is you know an exciting time for people that, that have been advocating for ecosystem-based management for a long time. Uh, but back to kind of Chad's line of, of questioning, you've answered it. Uh, the authority, I guess, uh, falls within uh, VMRC now with these allocations. Is there a, a mechanism of, of in-sector transfer per year? Like, like if, if one of the commercial sectors needed more quota that, that one of our other commercial sectors wasn't using, could there be an, an in-year transfer? Uh, great question, Dr. Neal. As of right now within regulation, no, there is not. Um, this is something that um, we've heard from a few uh, members of the public, um, so I do appreciate that comment. But as of right now in regulation, there is there is no mechanism to make that happen. Again, since this is uh, under the purview of the commission, um, that is something possible via regulation. Thank you. I think also that uh, pulling my code book out right now, but I believe that uh, to answer that, and Ms. Matson or, or Mr. Gear, you can kind of help me out a little bit, is that the code only allows the Commonwealth of Virginia or the Marine Resources Commission to undertake these type of regulatory changes within a certain uh, time framework. Um, and I think that, as I recall, find the code section. End of the year. I think. The it's, the, yeah, it's, it's only at the end, at the, It says at the end of the fishing year. Yep. Okay. So. Anyway, there there are some time constraints that that when we were discussing this this law change, I think a lot of folks wanted some certainty that we would not be jumping in and out of management uh, regimes or management ideas, so that from a business model plan or some certainty or whatever folks would know that. That's what they, what we passed is that's what they would be dealing with. So uh, I hope maybe that helps if, or if it hinders, I'm sorry. Further questions by members of the commission? If not, uh, this is a public hearing. I know I've been contacted by a couple of folks and I know wish to be heard. So uh, uh, either Ms. Matson or Ms. Smott, whoever is managing the speakers at this time, if you could call on the first speaker for me, please. Yes, first on my list, I have Tom Lilly. Tom, I'm going to unmute you now. 
Mr. Lilly, good afternoon. Good to have you with us. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay. Great. Uh, first off, Steve, I wanted to thank you and all the members of the staff and everyone that's instrumental in getting. Mr. Lilly, you're breaking up on us. You're coming and going. You were loud and clear to begin with. Okay. Uh, there is you that go. better? Is Perfect. that better? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, as I said, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone in Virginia that was instrumental to moving aid management over to the VMRC. Uh, Steve, if you don't mind, I'd like to take about one second, just say something about the staff presentation just now. Uh, am I coming through? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm clear. Uh, one thing, uh, that, as we understand it, the, uh, what the ASMFC does on Menhaden, most of that is directed to thinking about the Menhaden as a Atlantic fish. And the ASMFC, per se, is not concerned about Chesapeake Bay. Um, the statement that uh, Menhaden are not overfished does not apply to Chesapeake Bay. We've given you a, a scientific report from Katie Drew scientist at ASMFC, she makes it very clear that on a week by week basis as the factory fishing goes on, they have no idea how much, if any, menhaden in any measurable amount is left for the environment. So I hope I've cleared that up but, uh, and I hope I can add about a minute to this, Steve. Proceed, please. Are we, go are we going to, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, yes, um, I live on the Wicomico River that connects Tangier Sound, um, uh, and from Tangier Sound, I out Hoper straits, straits to the main bay. We're about 20 miles above the, your line, the Virginia line, called that the mid-bay. Uh, I'm involved in this because over the last five years, there's been a steady decline in the amount and condition of our fish and our birds. Our charter boats sit idle and really very few anglers uh, that we see out on the bay as we move through Hooker Straits over toward the Potomac. Uh, many of our fish that are caught in this river are caught with, uh, they're very thin, they have empty stomachs even later on in the afternoon. And members of the commission, almost half of our osprey nests that have been here. Half of those not uh, osprey nests failed. And our blue heron colony that was loved so much by so many people in our area uh, has just thinned out and disappeared over the last five years. And a lot of this stuff is directly due to the fact that we don't have a uh, popcorn bunker or uh, juvenile menhaden in our rivers anymore. Uh, when I go on, when Governor Northam wrote to Secretary Ross with his concerns about the factory fishing, he said Menhaden are a critical part of the diet of our wildlife. And he said, and I quote, allowing one company to jeopardize the balance is simply unacceptable, end quote. Um, we really only have to look at the condition of our striped bass and ospreys, the species that represent all of our bay fish and birds to see that that balance in the Chesapeake Bay is upset. It is out of whack. Uh, the summary that we gave you board members has the recent Chesapeake Bay press release and a letter from Professor Brian Watts. I'd like to briefly remind you what they've said. Striped bass are suffering from malnutrition and disease due to a lack of uh, menhaden. The breeding stock is far below target. And significantly, uh, as you see from the CBF report, the protein rich menhaden in their diet has dropped from 70% to 8%. Ospreys have been declining for a decade to a shortage of menhaden in the Bay, according to Dr. Brian Watts. And Dr. Brian Watts is the uh, head of the Center for Conservation Biology and a professor at William and Mary. He's been studying ospreys for over 50 years and I've given you his report. 
uh, his remarks are not to be taken lightly. This is a man that is dedicated uh, to this. And he says, as does CPF, ospreys are dying out in the main part of our bay. Osprey, uh, I think each of you are very familiar with ospreys, and you know that if there's menhaden in the area, ospreys will find them. Their lives and the survival of their chicks depends on that, and they are not finding them. Chicks are starving in the nests up and down uh, the bay, and we see this right here in the river, and it hurts. So these are two things that point out in our iconic signature species how far out of bay our bay due to the shortage of menhaden. At present, there's no protection for the Manhattan schools migrating into the bay in the spring. And that may be the nub of the problem that has plagued the bay for so many years. This flow of Manhattan is nature's way of rebuilding the Manhattan forage base in our bay. What do we mean by that? We mean the food to feed 4,000 square miles of fish and wildlife. And that takes a lot of menhaden. Uh, you have it, if you can, it would help in this to pull up that NOAA catch chart for the factory fishing, uh, which is the scan bottom center of my uh, submissile, uh, scan number 373. Anyway, that is the monthly chart that shows you over the years how much menhaden is caught by the factory fishing in May, June, July, and August. Uh, and that would help a lot in understanding the points we're trying to make uh, this afternoon. And let me say this, I think we know for sure that not enough menhaden is getting in from, uh, into our bay for our fish, the condition of our striped bass and ospreys and the dot information. We know that for sure. There is also a high degree of uncertainty whether any meaningful amount of menhaden in that spring flow of menhaden is wildly attaching. Uh, menhaden starts coming in in May. There are nine omega persaners allowed to target that spring flow. And as we said, the managers do not know if any meaningful amount of forage is left while they do that for the wildlife, while they do that week after week. There's a lot of history here, as all of you know, at the commission with Manhattan. Uh, Ten years ago, that commission realized that the size and complexity of our Bay ecology and the conflicts in the science and the disagreement over formulas were preventing progress on, May, on the uh, uh, May on the Manhattan depletion issues at the bay that had been going on for years. Um, in Bob Beale's letter to Secretary Ross at page uh, three, which I have given you a copy right there at the top of page three, he discusses this. And the thing that he mentions is that when all this uh, uncertainty was going on at the commission, the commission hired a consultant uh, to advise them as to what the best uh, means was to achieve conservation in the Bay when they were having all these problems with the qu uh, quantitative studies. And what that expert said, and it is a plausible solution and a good solution is to use time and area controls of the reduction industry to resolve these conflicts and, uh, and avoid the uh, unfortunate consequences. And this is what we're asking informationally. This is the information we're trying to give you this afternoon. Uh, just a little bit of information about uh, how this could be done and a couple possible suggestions how, uh, uh, that you might consider. And those are in our submissal, uh, option one and option two. Now, either of these measures and many like them, and many combinations of them, would allow you to protect those spring schools of Menhaden. Because keep in mind that that is not a river of Menhaden coming in. It's more like a stream that can be easily obstructed, dammed up, and diverted. 
And that's what's happening. And that's uh, what we need to discuss whether it can be corrected. Uh, if I can go on for just another minute or two, uh, the suggested measures would have the season not opened until, for example, June 30th. You could pick any date that you thought was reasonable. June 30th, uh, if you thought that was appropriate, would probably add about 25,000 tons of methane into the base food supply. Um, we figure it about two to 3,000 schools of methane be preserved. And the essential point is that this would get Menhaden to our bay wildlife at the time and place that they need it. Uh, emphasize here the time that they need it. Because of all the other measures that are in effect, such as the decreased cap, uh, you know, are not effective. The cap, if it works at all, you know, only is effective way late in the season. And the 10 percent uh, ERP reduction, which just occurred, uh, really doesn't help because that just puts us back where we were uh, two years ago. And all of these problems have been going on uh, for decades. So let me begin to come to a conclusion here uh, that the examples we're giving and the, hopefully the thoughts that we're planting in your minds are uh, options that could protect I'm losing you, Mr. Lilly, right at the end of your of your conversation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Uh, the, the options that we're giving you and hopefully the information that we're trying to, to plant here is, is just that. We're not asking for any immediate action here. You could do that, but we would really love to see this moved into a discussion phase with the with the public, with with you all, uh, and with, with your excellent staff. Um, so, uh, I could, you know, mention many, many, many other things and just real quickly, I hope you get a chance to look at our scan on the Amendment 3 comparisons, uh, because after all, the benefits of Manhattan under Amendment 3 and your Virginia law are, you know, really the benefits are to be given where they do the most good, uh, not only ecologically, but socially and economically. So we're talking about some of those startling comparisons, which are in that paper I gave you as to the number of people uh, that are affected. Uh, I think the one, a couple of those struck me the most, you know, we have about 200 fishermen on one side and about 100 or 400,000 fishermen on the other side. We have about nine boats and we have 50,000 fishing boats on the other side. Uh, we have you know, a company operating out of one marina, but there are 900 marinas in, in Maryland and Virginia. So the list goes on and on. Listen, thank you so much, all of you on the board, if you had a chance and did dig into those many attachments we put there. Uh, and Steve, uh, again, thank you uh, and everyone down there in Virginia for everything you're doing. I know this is on everyone's mind and, um, uh, sooner or later, hopefully we can work out some reasonable solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. I can assure you I uh, I read every one of the attachments. Uh, you, you're very uh, uh, dedicated to this. Any man that takes time to, to write what you write sometimes late in the evening, early in the morning, and I can assure you when somebody takes time to do that, I read every word of it. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Lilly, members of the commission? Yeah. Was that yes? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. Uh, who's next, ma'am? Next, I have Phil Lazik. Phil, you are now unmuted. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Also, Thank you. 
rates are instant.
Thank you, sir. Any questions by members of the commission? I, I had one question, Ed Tankard. Mr. Tankard, proceed, please. Uh, Mr. Bobeck, you mentioned that the bay represents, did I hear you correctly, uh, Chesapeake Bay, Virginia portion of Chesapeake Bay represents 26% of the total Atlantic Menhaden catch. Is that correct? Yes. That's a big, uh, big, big That's totally up to the uh, discretion of the uh, of the commission. So I think that to, to question the commission on that is out of order. But I, I understand where you're coming from. Thank you. Any further questions of the gentleman? Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time and effort. Who's who's next? Hold on just a second. I have AJ Erskine. AJ, okay. you're now unmuted. Mr. Erskine, good afternoon. 
Yes, sir, Mr. Commissioner, members of the commission. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is AJ Erskine. I'm with Representative Reedville Bait. Uh, we use a first name fishing vessel to harvest menhaden in the bay and the ocean. Uh, our menhaden is used for whole pot fisheries. Uh, it's grounded a chum for the sport fishing industry as well. Uh, our allocation, which has come up several times in discussion today, our allocation currently is 17.7 .7 million pounds. It'll be reduced clearly by the actions of the commission. Um, it's important to know we've caught our quota allocation ever since the sector allocation were determined several years ago. Um, and our bait markets are strong and a 10% decrease in harvest is very significant for us and the watermen and fishermen that our product supports. Um, I just wanted to give a brief synopsis of you know, what Reedville bait is, how we fit into the equation here. Um, we're a per seine, you know, fishing vessel, uh, like I said, that harvests in the bay and out in the ocean. It's critical to what we do. We are a small portion of what occurs uh, in Virginia. And I just wanted to quickly also add on to what Mr. Gear said about Dr. Neal's question um, about transfers. Um, there is transfer allowed of quota within the sector that we're in, in individual quotas. Um, we can transfer within our sector. And in fact, Reed Bill Bate did that um, a couple of years ago where we took additional quota as we had car caught our current allocation. So I appreciate your time and all your effort with uh, managing Medicaid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Erskine. Any questions for Mr. Erskine? Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else on the line, uh, Ms. Madsen or Ms. Mott? Next, I have Tim Wills. Tim, you are now unmuted. Great, thanks so much. Everyone hear me okay? Yes, sir. Great, fantastic. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'll be brief, I know you've had one heck of an agenda today. Um, first time I've ever done anything like this. Uh, I'm, a, I'm actually a Maryland resident, uh, lifelong resident on the Chesapeake Bay. I, Sounds like a couple other individuals uh, uh, contributed from Maryland as well today, but I don't bring any scientific uh, evidence to, to, to my conversation here today, but just just some perspective of my own as as just a recreational fisherman uh, on 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 the uh, on the, the Maryland side. Uh, grew up north of the bay, uh, uh, coming down to fish with my dad at the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, growing up in the 80s and 90s. Uh, just catching an abundance of bluefish and rockfish, uh, huge schools of rockfish. Um, uh, I, I, you know, fishermen exaggerate, but to say we would maybe catch 30, 40, 50 of each species uh, over the few trips uh, we did a year would not be an exaggeration. And now I fast forward and I live uh, right here uh, off the Magothy River in the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, um, where I once uh, came to fish uh, with my father. And it's just been amazing the difference um, that we now experience. So when we used to catch 30, 40, 50 bluefish a year at the Bay Bridge, I now have caught one bluefish in nine years uh, of boating here in the same exact fishing grounds. So it's a pretty, a pretty profound difference uh, that I've seen and recognized from, from my childhood to now as I take my boys out and, and try to have that same level of experience. And then uh, uh, similarly with rockfish, uh, remember the days growing up of big schools of rockfish up here by the bridge, uh, boats so close together because they were big schools that you had to push them apart. And now I'm, you know, again, fishing in the same grounds and we've caught, I think, two uh, rockfish keepers this year. So it's just an amazing uh, difference uh, over time. I, I'm not an expert, I, I do believe uh, reducing uh, the Manhattan catch, which impacts us as anglers uh, up here in the Maryland waters, will be uh, a great initial step uh, to helping restore, restore the prosperity that I had as a as a youngster. And maybe the last piece I'll leave you with is we have a fishing tournament here in our neighborhood, and uh, the trophy has all the all the top rockfish over the last 50 years uh, that have been caught by the winner in the neighborhood here. And unfortunately, the last three years, the winning fish has been a, been a catfish uh, because there's been a lack of ability to catch a keeper rockfish from uh, the historic uh, tournament over, over time. So I thought all of those points were, were, were very uh, relevant uh, to 
discussion today uh, on, on uh, controlling the menhaden catch. And I just wanted to share some experiences uh, from a just ordinary everyday uh, recreational fisherman. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Any questions of the gentleman? I did note that uh, much to my chagrin that the winning fish was a catfish, and we've heard that story many, many times ago. For blue catfish has gotten into our ecosystem and not done the best thing in the world, but uh, that is a discussion for another day. Thank you. Ms. Matson. who's next? On my list, I have Chris Moore. Chris, you are now unmuted. Uh, thank you, Shanna. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Bowman and members of the commission. Uh, I'll be very brief and uh, hopefully you had a chance to read my letter as well. Uh, first, uh, I think Shanna did a great job talking about the history of this uh, quota that you all hopefully will adopt today. Uh, it, it's been many years, many, many um, series of public comments and the, the, uh, the start of using ecological reference points has been widely supported uh, throughout the Atlantic coast um, over the past couple of years. Um, in, in doing that, I have to uh, mention uh, Commissioner Bohm and Secretary Strickler and Governor Northam. Their support of this process uh, has been key to making it happen, and we appreciate uh, their efforts over the last couple of years. Uh, one thing, too, I think I do need to correct a little bit is, is Chesapeake Bay Foundation, who I obviously work for, we haven't uh, released any new reports related to Menhaden. We have a, a long-standing uh, effort to work on the wise management of Menhaden all along the Atlantic coast. We've been doing that for about 25 years, and uh, we we really strongly support the wise management of this very important resource here uh, in Virginia and throughout the entire Atlantic coast. Uh, knowing that, um, I hope that the commission will see fit uh, to adopt the staff recommendation today and start uh, using ecological reference points to manage this uh, very important resource here in, in Chesapeake Bay and all along the Atlantic coast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you for all you do for our wonderful Commonwealth. Um, we really appreciate that. Any questions from Mr. Moore by members of the commission? All right, th thank you, Chris. Next person, ma'am. Next on my list, I have Ben Landry. Good afternoon, Mr. Landry. Uh, you're on board. Um, good afternoon, guys um, and, and ladies. Thank you for the opportunity to address uh, this commission. Um, probably for the first time under management, um, I represent Omega Protein, and we look forward to uh, the new management regime and getting to know each and every one of you once, um, I guess, uh, meetings are a little bit easier to take place. Um, I did want to comment on a couple of things that were said earlier, particularly by Ms. Madsen. It's it's really important to drive home on what the best available science is telling us. And you know, after ten years of of researching this with the best minds that we have along the Atlantic coast. Um, it's important to note that this stock is not overfished. Overfishing is not occurring. I heard a couple of hyperbolic statements earlier from some of the uh, public saying that, you know, this stock is clearly overfished and overfishing is occurring. And, you know, that's not the case with Atlantic Manhattan. Um, so, and I thank the, the VMRC for, for pointing that out. Um, uh, another important point is, you know, I've heard some speakers say that I used to catch all these striped bass, or I used to catch all these bluefish, and I used to catch all these weak fish, and now we're not catching anywhere near that amount. Um, you know, I, as again, as Matt said, um, Manhattan harvest could be dropped down to zero, and you're not going to see an improvement in those stocks until recreational harvest. Uh, is brought in to check a little bit. Uh, those three species are all currently uh, dealing with their own overfishing uh, events. Um, so that is not a result of a lack of Manhattan. Um, you know, a, a couple of other things is, you know, we look forward to, to working with you all. We believe very strongly that some of the um, 
very passionate pleas that you're likely to hear from the public um, is well intentioned, but oftentimes does not um, in in concert with the best available science and um, you know things like let's reduce uh, the Atlantic, let's remove the Manhattan Harbor from the Chesapeake Bay and the Three Miles. I mean those are uh, basically a death nail to a 140-year fishery in your state. Um, and if I may be honest, I think that's probably um, the goal of some of the speakers that we've had today. But, you know, this is a healthy fishery that employs hundreds of people in the northern neck of Virginia who would not otherwise have an opportunity to get uh, a good quality, high-paying job. And, you know, we there's a fundamental difference in the different user groups recreational and uh, commercial. We see that in every state that we operate in, but those should not trump best available science and the incredible economic harm that could be brought by uh, kind of a knee-jerk reaction, which is some of the, the requests that have been made of you. Um, so I look forward to working again with you guys. Um, the, I guess the vote that you guys will take here shortly we support. and. Um, we, we simply want the decisions that you guys make moving forward to, uh, based on the best available science. And we have great confidence in the staff, um, in Commissioner Bowman and Ms. Madsen and Mr. Gear, uh, mm -hmm. and others that I haven't mentioned, um, to, to always provide you um, with good sound uh, advice. So um, thank you for the opportunity to address you all. And, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys may have. Thank you, Mr. Landry. Does any member of the commission have a question for Mr. Landry? Zedrin here. Mr. Zedrin, proceed, please. Uh, one of the speakers talked about uh, the influx of Ben Hayden into the Bay in the early spring, say the May timeframe. Well, what's your take on that comment about maybe moving the season, uh, you know, for taking Ben Hayden back into the summer? Well, we wouldn't support that again you know the migratory patterns of this fishery are, are pretty consistent throughout the year they do uh come in and out in that that late spring early summer uh time frame we don't begin fishing until early to mid-may every year so you know any uh migratory patterns that are taking place in may and march april or early may that's going to occur without uh fishing vessels there and if you look at the patterns, you know, you know, it fluctuates year to year. Some some of those years, even though we have access to the Chesapeake Bay, we spend those first few months fishing out in the ocean. Um, so, it, you know, that in itself is a dramatic decrease in harvest because you can't add those months back at the beginning of this at the end of the season because you'll be facing what we're encountering now, which is fishing out in the ocean, unsafe fishing conditions. Um, you know, as I understand it, the weather's been pretty awful there the last uh, month or so. So getting uh, availability to get out on the water and catch fish towards the late fall, early winter is difficult. So basically that's just cutting into your season. Um, and that's not something that we, um, support and, and I'm not sure that scientific evidence would um, support that you would see any great benefit from that in other fisheries um, but again that, that's something that I would uh, rely on staff I guess to, to provide their guidance on. Further questions? Thank you Mr. Hey, Mayor. Kurt, I, I, I'm sorry I'm sorry uh, Mr. Sanker. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Landry, does it surprise you that um, the, the Virginia harvest is 25% of the Atlantic state's harvest? Um, it's been much higher in the past. If you um, recall, I'm not sure how, how closely you followed this species before, um, I guess, gaining regulatory authority of it this year, but just a couple of years ago, the 
quota was 87,000 metric tons, and it was dropped 41,000 metric tons in 2017. Um, so it used to make up a, a far greater percentage. Um, I don't know that, you know, the best available science indicates that there's a specific Bay Menhaden or a Chesapeake Bay Menhaden stock. Um, the guidance I've seen from the National Marine Fishery Service has always indicated that it's one unitary stock from Maine to Florida. So, you know, saying that this one sub-regional quota, which again only applies to, um, I'm sorry, they're doing a little work in my office, um, uh, which only applies to omega protein and not the bait vessels, you know, it should be a you know, a, a scientist's view that a dead Manhattan is a dead Manhattan, not its end use, whether it go to bait or for fish meal or oil. So um, it's not surprising, I guess, to answer your question and to say that it, it's been much higher in past years, and we've still got a very healthy stock. Um, you know, to reference Ms. Madsen's point earlier, even after the ecological yeah, reference enough. points, the population was still seen as above its target. Um, so that's the goal of management is to fish at your target. And we were above that number even after the GRP. So um, I hope that answers your question. Or if it doesn't, I'm, I'm happy to take another crack at it. No, thank you very much. Further questions by members of the commission? Thank you, Mr. Landry. Ms. Manson, who's next? That is the end of my list, Mr. Commissioner. So if anyone else still wishes to comment who has not yet commented, you need to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to let us know that you would like to speak. I will unmute the one phone line that I have just to double check to make sure that person would not like to speak. That phone line is unmuted. Hearing none. All right, thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, on, on this historical day, the, the matter is before the commission for discussion and ultimate action. Okay. Well, as so we all know, uh, I'm sorry. Hey, this is Christy Everett. I'd, I'd like to make a motion. Um, may I make a comment before the motion? Would that be okay? Of course. Thank you. Um, this issue has been debated for as many years as I have likely been around the commission since 1992. It certainly is fraught with emotion, with passion, with those that mean well, those that quite honestly are trying to uh, protect their way of life, whether it's recreational or commercial. And we've heard a lot of those stories throughout the years and distilled down today. I believe sitting around the, uh, the deliberation table at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that folks take this very seriously. And we're finally now, not finally, that's probably the wrong way, but we are definitely on the road to obtaining solid science. And I recall, not to wax poetic, but in July of 2006, when I took the dais for the first time as commissioner, I vowed that any decision that I could have any impact upon would be based totally on sound science and not on emotion or other outside influences because the only real fair way to do this is to rely upon the experts that we have. I realize that anecdotal evidence, observations, what you see many times are equating to reality. But I think that this approach takes into consideration a number of different factors that allow those concerns to be addressed. 
So today as we have Ms. Everett make a motion, whatever it may be, we start down the path of a very, very significant responsibility that's been afforded to us as a matter of public trust by the General Assembly, supported entirely by Governor Northam, Secretary Strickler and others that were in the corner at the end of the day. I think we had consensus. It's our duty and responsibility to make sure we get this right. And I'm proud to be associated with all those that got us here today. And I'm proud to be associated with this commission that's going to ultimately make this decision. Ms. Everett, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Governor. And um, those remarks, I think, are, are very, um, very important to kind of acknowledge um, the, the changes that we've seen um, with regards to this particular issue. So um, congratulations to all of your staff the administration for all the hard work over the past few years. Um, I'd like to make a motion for um, in support of staff recommendation to adopt the, these amendments to Chapter 4 BAC 2012-7010 pertaining to Atlantic Menhaden to establish the 2021 total allowable catch per amendment 3 to the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Menhaden and the Ecological Reference Point Benchmark Assessment to establish all associated fishery sector allocations in response. Mr. Zedrin? I second it. I second the motion. Thank you, sir. Further comments by members of the commission? They're hearing none. The chair will call the question. Mr. France? Aye. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Mr. Minor? Aye. Ms. Lusk? Ms. Lusk? Ms. Everett? Aye. Recalling Ms. Lusk? Aye. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Chair votes aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all very much for hard work on this matter and thanks to all that took time to participate and let us know how you feel about this subject. The next item on the agenda is recommendation from the Recreational Fishing Advisory Board and funding projects for the Virginia Saltwater Recreational Fishing Development Fund. Ms. Nelson, is that you? It is. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon and I promise this one's relatively brief. This item includes results from our RFAB, our Recreational Fishing Advisory Board's 2020 review cycle. And these are for projects funded from the Virginia Saltwater Recreational Fishing Development Fund, which you may hear us talk about as our uh, license fund, our recreational license fund. Next slide, please. The estimate of funds available <clears throat> in the license fund is just over $2.7 million. Um, that is relatively high for us in recent years. The RFAB reviewed 12 projects during this cycle, and all but one of them were ongoing or reoccurring projects that we have seen for several years. Um, and two of them also are traditionally split funded between both our commercial license fund and our recreational license fund because they benefit both fishermen. The RFAB reviewed all of these projects and recommended funding all of them for um, $491,311. Next slide, please. We have eight fishing events. All of these are sort of our reoccurring programs that we like to, to work with every year. Um, just a note that all of the 2020 events were canceled, I think as expected. Funds were returned to the agency, it, except for when that event or that group had already ordered supplies, and in which case they have reduced these 2021 events and hoping that they will still be able to have them. And they've reduced it by the amount that was spent on things like t-shirts, fishing rods, et cetera. Next slide. We have three free research projects. All of these are things we've seen before, um, but these do include the two that are split funded. Both our Young Veer American Eel Survey is uh, evenly distributed and our matching funds, that's our sport fish restoration funds, take a portion from the commercial fund and the majority of that match money from the recreational license fund. Next slide. This is our final project, and this is the only one that wasn't a reoccurring project. 
This is the reconstruction of a currently unusable pier at the Camp Captain Sinclair Recreational Area in Gloucester County that was reviewed by the board. Um, it's pending its JPA and that's separate from our process so nothing can be um, moved forward. We can still vote on it and they plan to get that in very soon. There were no issues with this program. Um, the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission uh, put, put forth that application. Next slide, please. The staff recommendation is funding projects A through L for expenditures totaling $436,310 from the Recreational License Fund and $55,001 from the Commercial Fund. If you have any questions about any of these projects or a process, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Does the Commission have any questions in reference to these projects? Alicia, I just have one, the, uh, the peer project from the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission. Yes. What, uh, in looking at that, can you just give me just a little bit of an idea as what that is going to be when it's finished? Because I'm, I can't. Any yeah. Would you mind going back one slide, Summers? So this, I just pulled this as a, as a general picture from their application. They, they've offered many more, but what you see there is their fishing pier that had been used. Um, most of that middle portion and uh, some of the end were completely ripped out by a storm. So what they're planning on doing is, in, is rebuilding on the existing footprint. Um, I believe they're going to have some, some railing uh, for the next time, and they're trying to, to use that cover there the shade area at the end. So they're not planning on expanding it any larger. They're just trying to rebuild what was there. Okay. That, that answers my question. I just wasn't sure exactly where we we're going to go. And um, can we go to the first slide too, please, Summers, if you would, uh, that one right there. Um, this, I don't mean to belabor the afternoon, but I think it's only appropriate if you take time to really, we've had a long day, but to look at these folks and look at the individuals that are involved and and just kind of at, at, at this time of the year give give a little thanks and hope for those that have been involved in in all these projects for low many years to advance the opportunities for our young people to experience the water and saltwater fishing for the first time um it's real easy to gloss right over the slide and we do that as a matter of business but uh these are pretty neat projects and if you ever get a chance to uh, to get out and about and want to see a smile on a kid's face when he holds a fishing rod and takes a fish the first time in his life, that's what this page is all about. So uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, any questions for Ms. Nelson at this present time on these matters? If not, uh, I don't believe this is a public hearing, but is there anyone in the public that wishes to be heard? They're seeing none. The matters before the commission for discussion and action. It's Dr. Neal. Yes, sir, Dr. Neal. Uh, it is. It is pleasing to see our license money uh, going to good things. Um, and I move to approve the uh, staff recommendation of the RFAB. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Is there a second to the motion? Mr. France, second. Thank you, Mr. France. Chair will call the motion. We'll call the roll. Mr. France. Aye. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Mr. Miner? Aye. Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes unanimously. Is there anything else to come before this commission by members of the commission or staff? There being none, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your service for this year. Um, really appreciate it. I hope you have a very safe and uh, joyous holiday season. If you need anything from us, don't hesitate to call. I would really treasure your friendship, appreciate your service, and have a great one. Thank you. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you.